Knocks it through. Mullen bursting into the box. Josh Mullen. Mullen's ball across. It's turned in. It's Pitman who's got it. Livingston leads. Now can they get the ball back in? O'Brien. The lead. And Livingston have the lead. Mum, the score. The full time whistle blows and David Hay celebrates. And the Livingston fans join in exultation. Livingston have the lead against Rangers. And they are certainly rising to a few occasions on their return to the top flight in Scotland. Hello and welcome back to Top Livy, the podcast dedicated to everything Livingston Football Club and Scottish football. My name's Ewan and today I'm joined by Andy and Callum Waugh. Callum Brown's too big time to take an hour out of his day to chat to us anymore. How's it going, boys? All good, mate. All good. How's things with yourself? Aye, no bad. No bad. I take it the, there's been a, more cows during lockdown because you, you've been milking quite a lot recently. Ah, mate. English going into a lockdown has kept us busy, so can he complain at all, mate? Can he complain? Andy, <laughs> sadly, sadly need to look at your ugly face again. How are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah mate, I'm good. Thanks for asking. Um, not sure about ugly face, so I think I bring this podcast up at least two points for my looks, oh, don't, personally. Don't, don't talk shit. Uh, don't talk shit. <laughs> Literally. Uh, Coming up on this episode, we'll take a look back at last weekend's win over Airdrie to seal qualification to the last 16 of the Betfred Cup. We then look back at the two Nations League games for Scotland, first up with Slovakia, followed by a trip to Israel. And finally, we'll take a look at our next league game. It's a massive game at home to St Mirren. Livy secured top spot in the section and a CD spot in the draw of the Betfred Cup last weekend thanks to a 4 1 win over League One side Airdrieonians. A perfect group stage for the Lions, who have an unbelievable record in the group stages of the competition. July 2016 was our last defeat in the group section, and since then we've played 16 times, won 13, and drawn the other three. Quite a remarkable stat, which has came from Dave Black. But anyway, a good win for the Lions. But the score, let's be honest, it did flag us a little bit, didn't it? Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say flattered, personally. I think first half, I think it was, uh, it was actually quite a decent game. Fairness to Erdre, I think they came to to try and win the game. Uh, they looked quite threatening on the counter attack, but I think we still created opportunities first half. Josh Mullen had a really good chance, which I think he should have done a lot better with, and we had another few openings on top of that. Um, second half went to go behind I think it did jolt us into uh, to the act a little bit and we got two quick fire goals after that uh, Alan Forrest first one brilliantly taken um, and then Jet with the penalty as well debatable penalty personally um, then we went and got the other Jet getting another one I think the free kick that led up to that I think Marvin Bartley has certainly bought that one um, and then Alan Forrest is is taking the taking the fourth really well. Great play by Sybil closing pressing from the front and and nicking the ball to play him in. But uh, I think I think overall second half after we went went behind I think we were really in control of the game to be honest and uh, we probably could have scored more on the afternoon. But in fairness to Erdre, it was a bit like the Alawa game in the sense that they gave us a bit of a fright um, during the game. But I think over the piece I think we were comfortable. We were comfortably the better team, and I think we deserved to win. Uh, I, w- I wouldn't have said, I wouldn't have said the margin that we won by in the end was wasn't reflective of the score. Personally, I thought in the first half we just seemed to be a little bit lethargic. I thought we were creating stuff, but we just weren't clinical enough. Um, I think that we were when we got into positions, we could have moved the ball a bit faster. We could have done things a little bit. Seemed to just we seemed to try and make it a bit scrappy. 
um, but it just didn't seem to work out. I thought, as you and said, Erdrey came with a game plan and they executed it fairly well. They came and I, I actually posed a bit of a threat. They never came just to sit in and try and see what they could get. They, they actually came out a little bit and I thought, to be honest, when they scored, I think the, the celebration from the boys kind of spurred us on. I think it's kind of rubbing salt, salt a wee bit. Uh, into the wounds just when we've conceded and he thinks he's taken off his top and everything in a Betfred Cup game uh, is a wee bit over the top for me but um, you go up the park and then you're scoring you score, score straight away it just kind of proves that that was it and I thought Jet actually played fairly well on Saturday I think he seemed to be a bit more of a threat um, but I don't know if that's just because of the standard of the opposition that we were playing Yeah listen when I say flattered I, I, I mean Personally, I thought it was a really good game of football. Um, I was I was impressed by Erdre. Um, I thought they came and, and gave it a good go. Out of the group stage teams that we've played, I think they've came at us the most and gave us sort of the most entertaining game. Uh, they had a, so, a few chances in the first half, like ourselves. So that, that's where the flat rate comes from. I, I, personally, I don't think a three-goal deficit is reflective of how Airdrie played. I thought they were much better than that. Uh, but I get what you're saying. We did create chances and obviously we did, sorry, once we went behind, take, took control of the game and, and and dominated possession and created chances. And yeah, okay, I can see uh, we've scored four, we could have scored more, but that was more a reflection on how I felt Airdrie played, which I thought they were very good. We made six changes to the team uh, from the, the win over Stenhouse Muir the, the most significant one was, was Scott Pittman. That was just the uh, rest and wasn't it for big league games ahead? Yeah, I mean, Pittman, one of the first names on the team sheet. You've heard both the gaffer and Davey talk about it before. If they could have a team of 11 Scott Pittmans, they would. Uh, so I think it was a good opportunity to, to give Pitts a little rest. Um, obviously, we saw Josh Mullen and Forrest starting the game again. Uh, Mullen came off slightly earlier on. Uh, I agree with you, Wa. I think, Jet, the last two games, I think he needed those sort of games, to be honest. Um, he bullied bullied the centre-halves. His, his link-up was starting to look a bit sharper. I think I think we're just going to need to admit that Jet's not going to start running channels for you and uh, running in behind. Type. He's not that type of centre-forward anymore. I think it will be feeding the ball into his feet and, and play off him from there. But I think him getting a couple of goals um, will certainly boost his confidence going into this next run of games and as I say I think the two games really suited him in terms of kind of getting a bit of confidence bullying centre halves and he did that really well but now nah, it was uh, <laughs> the celebration was fantastically over the top uh, from the boy uh, that Carson referred to as Tam Bobby um, I mean they're already out the bet Fred Cup and he's celebrating like that I mean that's, that's cringeworthy. It's just absolutely cringeworthy. And I agree with you. It's probably sparked a bit of reaction from our players just going, oh, we'll just, we'll show you kind of the class on the park type thing. And uh, I mean, Forest's Forest equaliser was, was class on its own. Nah, it was it was a good afternoon. Um, hopefully it gives us a little bit of momentum going into what's an important run of games now. Uh, and obviously we've got, Air United to look forward to in the, in the next round at home as well, which hopefully can set us up for a quarter final. Yeah, it's like it's a good draw that one, isn't it? Because when you when you look to the the seeds and the unseeded teams, you know all you can ask for really is a home tie against a lower league opposition, and it's exactly what we got. So we we can't really complain about the draw, can we? We can a little. I would have rather that seaside league mob Falkirk just to give them another scudding. Just for folk that don't know, Callum Moore spends approximately, I'd say, 16 hours of his day on Falkirk's Twitter and screenshotting Falkirk's Twitter and their fans on Twitter. Um, and we get sent these on a regular basis from Callum. He, he really has something against Falkirk. And to be honest, I totally agree with you. Yeah, I think it's something we can all get behind, Callum. Um, the hatred of Falkirk on this podcast is exceedingly excellent. Um, we have one or two Falkirk fans that listen in, I believe. Uh, you and you know a, a Falkirk fan. I've got a Falkirk fan I work with. They, they both listen in. So if you are listening in on this, it is personal. We, we do dislike you. We do dislike Falkirk. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> we're going off track a little bit. It was a good draw. Do, do you see us 
using the, the cup almost, I, mean, I spoke about the record earlier in the sort of intro of it and how good a record we've got. We're, we're approaching these games over the years really professionally as a football club, which is great to see. And it's a good opportunity to progress into the, the latter stages of the cup now with a home tie against the air, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a massive opportunity. It's, it's a wee bit similar to last year, how we got four for in the, in the last 16. But I would have been more concerned having to go to Somerset Park. A record over there is a bit, a bit sketchy, to say the least. But I think the are going to be well up for the game, to be honest. There, It reminds me a little bit of when we drew Cali Thistle last year in the Scottish Cup. They're one of these teams that seem to quite like the, the cup competitions and that kind of one-off tie almost played us last season in the in the group stages and I was really impressed with them. They came and, and had a proper go and I think they'll do the exact same. It's a one off game. Um so it's definitely a it's a it's a proper banana skin of a tie for us. But as you say it's it's a massive opportunity to get to a quarter final and hopefully the team approach it in the same manner that they've approached the four games in the group stage, be very professional and, and get us to the last eight. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's been a, a great cup run for us uh, so far this season. Four wins out of four, scoring a lot of goals. Defensively, we've been better, which we should against the teams that we drew against, but you only, you can only play who's been put in front of you. Uh, it's a couple of weeks' time away, the, the cup, so the last 16 game. So we've got a few big league games before that. So hopefully we can go into that cup game on the back of some really good and really important wins in the league. After the highs of defeat in Serbia on penalties to, to secure Scotland's place at the Euros in a major competition for the first time in 22 years last week, have you actually recovered, June? Yeah, I've been off work this week, so I've had plenty of time to recover from that. It was uh, the, the nicest hangover I've ever had. Uh, it, was, it was a pleasant hangover, considering that I spent the day just watching the Scotland team singing Yes Sir, I Can Boogie and doing a conga line singing about David Marshall. It's pretty much how I spent my day, other than a couple hours doing the podcast, which I'm not going to lie, I struggled with. I uh, struggled to get my words out on it, but uh, nah, it's, I'm, still, I'm still on a high from Thursday, despite the last couple of results. Our attention's turned to the remaining Nations League game, so we had two games left in the group. Going into the double header with Slovakia and Israel, we sat four points ahead of the Czech Republic. Could we keep the momentum from the playoffs and secure promotion to the A section for the next campaign? So let's start with the Slovakia game. A 1-0 defeat. Tough one to take after the relatively good performance. What would you say, lads? Yeah, I think it was, it was a disappointing result. I think it was more a disappointing result considering how we played. I think we absolutely dominated the game, to be honest, from start to finish. I don't think the Czech Republic, uh, sorry, Slovakia even had an effort on goal within our 18-yard box. Um, the most threatening efforts they had were kind of 20, 25 yards. And the goal goal takes a, a deflection, which basically leaves Craig Gordon flat-footed as well. Made eight changes to the team from the from the Serbia game, which we kind of half expected, considering the exertions that they probably would have put into that game. But now I think, the, for me, the only negative was the result. I think the only other thing you could say is we need to be more clinical. We created ample opportunities in both halves of the game. I think McBurney's had two great chances first half. Palmer's had a couple of good chances coming in at the back post. Uh, Christie's had an effort. McQueen's had a header save second half. Griffiths has had an effort with the last kick of the ball as well. So it wasn't like we weren't creating opportunities. I think there were positives from the performance. I thought Christie was excellent again. I think Christie's been excellent all three games, to be honest. I think Tierney playing as the, as the wing back rather than the centre half. I was really impressed with him against Slovakia. I thought he was a constant threat down that side. Um, but now I think there were lots of positives to take from the Slovakia game, despite despite the result. And to be honest, I, I know we'll touch on it later, I thought there was positives to take from the Israel game as well. But um, I think for, for Scotland, in years gone by, we would have gone into these games away from home and probably sat in and tried to counter a bit more, I think. We've gone to Serbia, taking the game to Serbia. We've gone to Slovakia and taking the game to them as well. And I think it shows a bit of a change in mentality from the team. Yeah, listen, I, I agree with 
pretty much everything you've said there, you and uh, it was a, a very frustrating night, and I think that frustration, like you say, came from the end result rather than the performance. I agree. I thought we were very good on the ball. We we dominated a, a side uh, that are higher than us in the rankings and in, in the world rankings away from home. Uh, albeit a team that had very little to play for, but we we had to again. It goes back to the play who's in front of you. And I thought we were very good. I pick on some pick up on something you did say about uh, loads of positives. I don't want to go into it too much because you know you get criticised all the time for having a go at Ollie McBurney. But I was again very disappointed with his performance. I didn't think he offered a great deal. You mentioned the chances he missed. I, I felt. The game against Slovakia, if we had a Linden Dykes or a Lee Griffiths starting that game, we win the game. We, we don't just draw, we go and win the game and we qualify with our game to spare. Um, he's got a lot of catching up to do, Ollie McBurney. Uh, I've still not seen much from him that, that gives me any kind of confidence that he'll do a job up front on his own. Uh, he doesn't play in that system at his club. He plays with two up front. Um, and, and it shows, it shows he, he's got a real lackey, sort of that instinct of being the lone striker. And, and it's something we rely on heavily just now with the, the, the formation we play under Steve Clark. The other one I'll pick up on is 100% agree with you on Kieran Tierney. I thought he was arguably the best player in the park in the game. Uh, he was fantastic getting up and down the, the, the left-hand side. And it, and it posed the question that are we, are we not taking advantage of Kieran Tierney's ability to get up and down because when you compare Tierney and Robertson you could argue that Tierney has had the better of it at left back than what Robertson has and I know it's a difficult situation but are we wasting Kieran Tierney playing him at, at centre back? Where, where do we fit them in? It's a, it's a difficult one. Going on to the Kieran Tierney one Tierney plays left centre half for Arsenal in a, as part of their back three He's playing there week in, week out for his for his club. He's coming in, we're slotting him into a position that he's familiar with, and he can do a job there. I think in the last couple of games he's been brilliant. I do I do think that Tierney and playing as a left back on on Sunday he offered a lot, and the ball in is perfect uh, for Kenny McLean, and McLean's got to bust the net. He's timed his run perfectly from midfield coming in, and realistically you're expecting him to score. It's a good save by the keeper, but he's made it easy. Anywhere else in the goal, that's, it's, we're back in the game, it's 1-1. And then the momentum's with us. We should, we'll should probably go on and we should take something from the game. And Andy goes on to this Ollie McBurney debate. I'm probably one of the people that don't actually mind McBurney too much. Um, I think that he's probably what you said was correct, Andy. It's, it's probably a bit what we're going through at the moment at Livingston when we've got Jet up front. McBurney's not your player that's going to run into the channels. It's not someone that's going to go and chase the ball down. He's someone that's actually better probably getting the ball played into his feet and his link-up play. And that's what I think. But I, when we are playing a lone striker, we're expecting someone to run into the channels and take a bit of pressure off us. We're used to actually soaking it up. I, I don't mind McBurney. I think that when he scores, he's going to end up probably scoring, going on and scoring a few for us. It seems like if he's trying far too hard to score. I can see Semple's face right now that's screwing up, but we'll go back to Ewan because maybe he'll speak a bit more sense in Semple. Well, I I agree with you to an extent with McBurney. I think, I think he is almost trying too hard to prove these the mass critics he seems to have uh, when he plays for Scotland. I think he is... I think there are aspects of his game that are improving uh, when he is playing as a lone striker. I think there were moments in the game against Slovakia where he's knocking the ball on and his instinct is to get into the box when he's knocked it wide and stuff like that. I think that that side of it's improved. And yes, he missed a couple of chances, but he was there to miss them, which, you know, as a striker, it's worse if you're not getting on the end of these chances, I think. I think I agree with you. I think if he gets one, that that might just change the whole perspective. Tell you what, if he goes and scores at the Euros and scores one of the winners in one of the three group games, he's an absolute legend, isn't he? And the Tartan Army will be all forgiven. I think the Tartan Army are a tough crowd to please uh, at the best of times. But uh, I want McBurney to succeed in the Scotland jersey because he's a Scotland player. And, you know, there's folk like Semple out there that just don't want him to succeed. Uh, he's just that type of person, isn't he? Uh, it goes back to the full Chris Martin debate from years ago. 
Chris Martin got absolutely caned from the Tartan Army, and then he scores one of the. He gets himself into the box and he, he changes the game. It was either against Slovakia or Slovenia at hand, and, and everyone's yeah, singing. Slovenia. And everyone's singing his name after he goes and gets that goal. I, I think I, as soon as he scores, I think it's just going to change. I, I cannot believe you've thrown me under the bus there, you, and there is nothing more that I would want than Olly McBurney to succeed and score a bag of loaded goals for Scotland. It goes back to this debate, and I, I tweeted it the other day there, that for some reason certain uh, sections of uh, uh, Scotland fans or Scottish football fans, should I say, maybe not Scotland fans, uh, I'll say that people that criticise McBurney just hate a certain club that he supports. I couldn't care less if he supports Rangers, Celtic or Airbus UK. If he pulls on the Scotland jersey, I'll 100% support him and get behind him. Do I think he's been up to scratch for Scotland? I, I don't. I think that's fair to say. For me, a striker that's getting those chances, I understand what you're saying, but for me, a striker of his quality, let's not forget, he, he signed for a club for £20 million. He's playing in the Premiership down south. A player of his ability and his price tag, to me, should be finishing off at least one of those three chances that he got. Now, I get that I 100% agree with what you're saying. Uh, I, I, again, it was another tweet I put out. It almost got to the stage on uh, in the game that it felt like we were giving him the ball all the time to try and get him that goal. And it just wasn't working. And, and I, you could see the pressure building and building and building that it wasn't working for him. I would love nothing more than him to grab a goal and especially a big goal in the Euros. To, to send us to three points and get us qualifying. But I just don't see it. I just don't see it, personally. Now, nah, what, what we'll do is we'll we'll move on from the Ollie McBurney debate because we've got another opportunity to throw Andy under the bus after something he said in a group chat last night. So I cannot typical wait Scotland, for this one. So in typical <laughs> Scotland fashion, it was back down to earth with a bit of a bump. Defeat left us with a tough-looking trip to face Israel, needing a win to secure the section. Sadly, it wasn't to be as we again felt a 1-0 defeat. Coupled that with two wins for the Czech Republic, we dropped a second in the section. Uh, that was quite a tough one to take uh, last night, uh, wasn't it? Uh, aye. Uh, it's another one that we've turned up and actually put in a very good performance away from home. It's something for years that we've actually been... We've went to away games and we've went right. We'll walk away with a 2-0 defeat here and it's actually not damaged limitations. We do, hopefully we don't play too bad. The defence have probably made one mistake last night and it's McTominay getting caught out. You've probably seen that he isn't 100% a centre-half. I think in the, the other games that he's played, the game against Serbia, he was, at, he was outstanding. Um, and then last night, he just... He made one mistake. He's been turned far too easily and it's a good finish. You can't take anything away, but we've then created opportunities again. We just didn't seem to have that fit, that cutting edge to put the ball in the back of the net. Um, I think there was still a lot of good performances, but there seemed to be far too big of a gap between the two midfielders and the defence. The game against Serbia, someone was always dropping deep to pick up the ball and try and start attacks that way. Um, but uh, it's it's a frustrating one. It's very, very frustrating to put in that performance and not come away with anything. Yeah, it is frustrating. Uh, and But at the end of the day, we've blown two chances to qualify for the Nations League. We were four points clear going into these two games. Let's not forget that Israel are 8-8 to in the world rankings. We are 45th. We've, we've not beaten them now in three games. That's including the playoff game because we believe we, obviously, we beat them on penalties, but we drew with them in 90 minutes. We drew with them at Hamden early on the group, and we've lost to Israel now. Albeit it was a, a decent performance, a decent enough performance for 45 minutes. I, I thought we were very flat in the second half. I don't, didn't think we were. We played. Uh, we created an awful lot in the second half. The game kind of went away for us, I felt. Uh, to be honest, did we create much? We had the McGinn header. I mean, was there, was there much, really, that, that was proper chances in the game? Israel didn't create much either, by the way. They obviously scored their, their probably one, maybe two chances they had. They scored one of them. But I don't think we were great in the game. Um, and to me, we've, we've blown a great opportunity to get promotion into the A section and almost guarantee ourselves a, a, a World Cup playoff. And, and 
at the end of the day, we, we've got a playoff, we've got a Euro spot through the, the Nations League, and it was another opportunity to, to do that for the World Cup. And, and I, I feel like we're, we're too, too busy at, at the moment in this country going, like, it doesn't matter, we're in the Euros. Now, the World Cup was a massive, that's a massive opportunity to get to the, the playoffs for the World Cup. Not guaranteed, but a huge opportunity. And I just feel like it's getting shrugged off these two defeats because we're, we're in the Euros. And it doesn't really sit right for me. I don't think you can look at the two performances and say that the players were looking at it as uh, just two games, let's brush it off, we've qualified for a tournament. I think both performances reflected that they went there and tried to win both games. They've been a bit unfortunate in the sense that they've not taken the opportunities. I disagree with you. I think we've created ample opportunities in the game. Dykes had a header first half. McGinn had a first half. O'Donnell's had one which he should at least hit the target as a minimum. Second half, O'Donnell's got Marciano to make a save. Griffiths has two late on, one that he snatches at in the box. McBurney's had um, a chance as well. I, I think that's plenty of opportunities to, to put a game to bed. Marshall's had two saves to make and one of them's gone in, you know, over the piece. Clear, clear, uh, clear cut chances, though. I mean, they're, they're half chances. There's a couple of good chances, but most of them you've just described are half chances for me. Right, are we going to get into the nitty-gritty of what creates a half chance and what's a full chance now? Are you going to be this times goal person now? Is this what you're going to become? Really? You really, you really degrading that. yourself to that, Andy? Really? Go work for the Rangers report, you dick. Nah. <laughs> Calm down, Ewan. It's just an opinion. Right. Ewan, bring out but, his group chat statement for last night. Right, but for me, I think we created plenty of opportunities to win the game. If we're more clinical, we see both games to bed and we almost take maximum points from the two games. Um, granted, I'm bitterly disappointed that we didn't take advantage, right? It was a great opportunity to get to Section A and, as you say, an opportunity at the World Cup, but I don't think it's just getting brushed off, certainly not by the coaching staff or the players. I think the players have gone into both games with the mentality of trying to win the games and they've unfortunately not taking the chances that they've created over both games and it's resulted in two defeats. OK, I'll, I'll, sorry, you're right, you know, I will clarify what I was saying. I don't think the coaching staff or the players have, have went into with that attitude. It's more so the fan base. You know, you've seen many fans on Twitter posting, oh, well, we're still going to the Euros, so fuck it, for example. Things like that. And I know that's not the players and the players have went in fully intentional to win the game. It's not happened, though. Um, we have failed and before you, you try and throw me under the bus with your twisted thing the question I posed on the group chat last night and this is not my opinion I am 100% behind Steve Clark uh, I'm delighted we've qualified I can't be any more excited for the, the Euros but the question I posed on the group chat was if, if we had failed to beat Serbia in the playoff final that's, thankfully we never, thankfully we won but if we'd failed and then we'd, we'd thrown away a four point lead at the top of the group as well going by the performances of previous games, despite the, the, the wins and the, the unbeaten run the performances, the, the strange substitutions that we make almost every game would Steve Clark be under pressure from the Scotland fans? That's not me saying he would be under pressure from me but generally the Tartan Army to me they would be giving them stick we did not. I'm that sorry. I'm your sorry. comments from the group chat right here, Andrew. So let's get into it. So you did say, see if we didn't win the playoff game, Clark would be under serious pressure. A. Eh? You replied with no chance, and you asked him, really, we've blown this majorly. So you're basically going along the lines of agreeing with that that Steve Clark would be under serious pressure. Yes, for me, it would be. we went into this international break unbeaten. Yeah, but it was but, the biggest feel good factor probably that we've had in an international scene in years. It, it, like I say, it's, it's a rhetorical question. I, I do believe, I, I do believe that he would be under a lot of pressure if we didn't qualify for the Euros and we failed to qualify for the, the Nations League section, given the position we were in. I think that's a fair statement to make. I'm not saying that, I, I mean, Steve Clark's taken us to the Euros, so as, as far as I'm concerned, he's an absolute legend. It was a rhetorical question that if we didn't get to the Euros, 
would they be under pressure? And for me, it would be 100% be under pressure. Andy, I, I think you're talking bollocks. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, I watched, I remember watching us play Israel under Alec McLeish, and that is one of the most abject performances I have ever seen from a Scotland team that posed zero threat, that looked completely all over the place, completely unorganised, and I genuinely did not see where the international team was going. I think the international team has an identity under Clark. I think that's been evident the last three camps. You can see the shape of the team. You can see it's been worked on. It's been well drilled. I think Clark now knows probably 80, 85% of what he's starting 11 is. I think he probably knows eight or nine of the first names on his team sheet. I think the last couple of camps, I think he's addressed the, the lack of threat up top from previous games. And I think we've looked a much better team. I can't remember the last time Scotland went and played three games back to back away from home and dominated games in the manner that they have. I don't ever remember watching us do that. I remember us having a decent going games under Gordon Strachan, but we were never capable of keeping a clean sheet under Strachan. That was our biggest downfall. We were, you know, at the back, we were constantly ropey. I think, you know, he's had our longest undefeated run in 32 years as Scotland manager. And you've mentioned it already two or three times. It's not his fault, some of the opposition that he's had to face in that. You can only play who he's put up against. To be honest, he's won two games against the Czech Republic, who are higher ranked. He's beat a Slovakia team that are higher ranked. Um, Serbia team that's higher ranked. I think and he's taken us to our first major tournament in 22 years and you're questioning the manager. Fucking nope. madness. I am not questioning the manager. Again, you're twisting my words and my question entirely. You're, you're twisting it entirely for your own benefits to throw me under the bus and make me look fucking stupid. And it's not the case. I'm not, quest- <laughs> I'm not questioning the manager. You've just listed off a whole load of reasons why he's done such a great job in, in the Scotland national setup. Do I like the, the style of play? No particularly, but does it matter because we're winning games and drawing games? Absolutely. I mean, who cares? We have qualified for the Euros. Is he a legend? Will he go down as a legend in Scottish football? 100% will. The question was if we didn't qualify, which makes it almost irrelevant, the question, because we did qualify. So it doesn't matter anything that's happened for their own because he is a legend. He's a manager that's taken us to the first major competition since 1998 and I 100% back him for that. I, I just want to go back to the point I like the style of play that, and you said no. So did you not like the style of play that Livingston played to get promoted? Because it's for me, the two teams are mirrored. I'm not, I'm not so sure. I'm not convinced they're mirrored. I mean, Livingston were blood and thunder 100 miles an hour. Scotland are not like that at all for me, what I'm watching. By, by all means, by the way, you're right, Ewan. We're, we're very good tactically. You know, we know how we play. We're, we're set up well, which is credit to the manager and credit to the backroom staff, which is great. Do, do I think it's entertaining to watch sometimes? No, I don't. It's nothing like the way Livingston played in a promotion season because Livingston were 100 miles an hour then. Scotland aren't. I disagree in the style of play. I think the last five games, in particular the, the Slovakia game at home, the Czech Republic game at home, I think we have had a decent style of play. We're playing on the counter, we're playing a bit quicker when we're on the counter. Obviously, the last two games, teams have sat in a bit, they're defending the lead, so it makes the game slightly different. Um, I'd argue this until the cows come home. I think I think you're mad to even be posing the questions, to be honest. Um, I missed three games under the Art McLeish era, and I remember being in San Marino after we came away from a negative goal difference from two games against Kazakhstan and San Marino and thinking, where the fuck is this national team going? And and Steve Clark, from the moment, in my opinion, the moment Steve Clark got the job, he got the fans on side. He had the fans on side. And I think that momentum, even from that first game against Cyprus where we got the, first, the late goal, I think the momentum's carried through from there. Yeah, Clark's, you talk about some of the performances he's had. He's been without probably our best striker in Lee Griffiths up until the last this campaign, this uh, group just now. Um, he had eight months without seeing his players. You know, I just think you're, 
you're mad. And then he had a qualification campaign which he came into, which was doomed from the start. Like, against he had to play two games against Belgium and two games against Russia in his first five games. I can't believe you're criticizing the guy. Anyway, since you've you've thrown me under the bus multiple times this evening, uh, fair play, you you've have called me out on it. It was a rhetorical question, but fair enough. Uh, how would you assess the international campaign then over the last three games? How would you how would you assess the, the break in terms of how well we've done and the results and everything all in? For me it's it's quite simple. Would you rather win one of your nations league games to get promotion to pot A and have a possibility at a playoff? Or would you rather win the playoff game? and qualify for a major tournament for the first time in 22 years. I think if you ask any Scotland fan that, there's only one answer. I think the performances in the other two games, I think, were were good. I don't think there was a lot wrong that we did in the two games. And we've, we've done the job. We've got the job done finally in one of these qualification campaigns in the sense that we've got a major tournament to look forward to. I think I'm not excusing the two results in the end but at the same time we have a major tournament to go to next summer and we haven't had that for 22 it'll be 23 years when we go Uh, for me it's probably one of the I think Andy Robertson tweeted about it it's probably the pinnacle of international breaks that we've had over over the last number of years because we've achieved something unthinkable which was getting back to a major tournament which is the fans want more than anything, not just the possibility at a playoff. It's not even a guaranteed playoff. It's a possibility at a playoff at the same time. All I can say is, yes, sir, I can boogie. Finally, on this episode, we're going to take a look ahead at our huge game against St Mirren at the weekend. Both teams struggling for form in the league, sitting 10th and 11th, but St Mirren have three games in hand. If we want to start climbing the table, this this has got to be a must-win for us, hasn't it? Yeah, let, let's be honest, it absolutely does. Um, going into the league campaign, you'd be looking at home games against St Mirren, Hamilton, St Johnston, Dungeon United, all these teams you'd be looking to pick up points and win games at home. And it's not been the best start to the, the season for, for us, certainly not for St Mirren. Um, but we'd be targeting this regardless as three points. And I think given the, the league table and the amount of games they've got in hand, OK, games in hand don't give you points. You need to go and play them and win them. But given the amount of games they have got in hand, uh, it's a good possibility to put a gap between ourselves and them. And I, I, I do agree. I think it's a, it's a must-win game. You've got to agree it's a must-win game. If we don't win... At this stage of the season we're now in, we will 100% be in a relegation battle if we don't go and pick up points in this game for me. Yeah, I, I think the next running games, I think the next three or four kind of leading up to Christmas uh, are, for, in my opinion, season-defining. I think it will define whether we're going to be in a scrap or whether we can be in a push for the top six. I think they're that crucial. Um, Next three games, including the cup tie all at home. We've got St Johnston to play away from home, Hamilton away from home in this run as well. So I think there's there's big opportunities to get points on the board. Uh, but again, I always say this, the other team is going to be targeting us for points as well. They'll see our start to the season. They'll see that we've not been as steady at the back as we have been in previous years. Uh, and they'll fancy their chances at getting points against us. But it's a massive game. Uh, St Mirren and had what looked like a fairly bright start to the season, obviously beat us on the opening day. And, but since then, it's been pretty it's been pretty dire for them, uh, to be honest. A couple of uh, outbreaks with COVID as well to, to throw into the mix with that. So we we need to take advantage uh, on on Saturday and we need to start opening that gap between ourselves and St Mirren and Hamilton at the bottom. Yeah, I think, uh, touch on what you, what you just said there, Ewan, I think it, it shows... How poor we've been defensively, you know, we've, we've we've almost prided ourselves over the last few years in terms of how we've defended and how many clean sheets we've kept. 23 goals, I think, we've conceded in the league this season so far, which is the second highest in the league. Now, 
something's got to give at the weekend because St Mirren have only scored three goals away from home this season. So one of us is scoring goals or one of us is keeping a clean sheet. Uh, hopefully it's a clean sheet or, you know, I don't care if it's a clean sheet, actually. We just need to win the game. I don't care how we do it. We need to win the game. Both teams are in awful form. We are no wins in four in the league, obviously, taking out the cup games. I think St Mirren are no wins in eight or nine. I don't think they've won since, God, uh, I don't think they've won. Hamilton away. Yeah, that's right. Hamilton away. I, I, kind of, I wrote it down, but I've lost it in all the notes here. Hamilton away on the 15th of August was the last time they won a game. Uh, they're bottom of the form table. You know, everything points to a good opportunity for us. It's at home. Problem being, our home form hasn't been great. Seven points for seven games is, again, not up to our usual standards in the league. And it is something we said last season, that if our home form drops off, we could be in trouble. And unfortunately, it's kind of shown that this season so far, that our home form hasn't been great. And we are down near the bottom of the table, albeit a few points ahead. But again, without being negative, it, it, I mean, two, two, three weeks ago, we were sitting sixth in the table. We were looking up the way after beating Dundee United. A couple of bad results in the league. We're now 10th again and everybody's doom and gloom. So it's so quickly it can turn. You know, and hopefully this is the beginning of it turning for us at the weekend because it is a huge game, but it's a huge game for both clubs, undoubtedly. 100%. I think that we need to be at the races from the first minute, the first whistle on Saturday. I think that we need to come out and we need to put in probably our first full 90-minute performance in the league this season. I think that we've kind of struggled in home games, especially with pr- producing a performance that lasts for the full 90 minutes. We seem to come out in one of the halves and turn up and we're not a good enough team that's going to that can turn up and play well for 45 minutes and then just less our resting our laurels, sorry. Um, I think that it's a massive opportunity on Saturday to go and set a marker for the rest of the season. That's exactly what we need to do. We need to set a way that we want to actually go and produce for the rest of the season. We need to have something that we can go back to. We need to get back to our old basic ways. Um, And that's hopefully what we'll see on Saturday is a positive performance and something that can lift the spirits of the fans. Yeah, Callum, you touched on the getting back to basics sort of thing. I think for those who watched the Ross County game, I think you could see first 45 minutes, there was a lot of that getting back to basics, you know, scrapping, winning second balls, 50-50s, you know, all the things you need to do to just win a game of football anyway. Um, I think we did see elements of that in the Ross County game. uh, And I'm sure that's probably been getting hit home over the last couple of weeks as well. Uh, We need to carry that on. But what I liked in the Ross County game is we, we still offered a threat second half. In particular, we did get the ball down. And that's the difference with us this season. I think we we look a bit more creative and I do think we'll create opportunities against the minute. How, how, do you see us, how do you see us lining up then? We've obviously seen a few changes over the, the two cup games. How do you fancy seeing us line up? Well, I think um, Strijek and Tiffany are both going to be available. I think that was uh, reported today that they'll be available um, for the game. I think they're out of isolation from Thursday. Depending on if they're fit or not, I, I can see Strijek slotting back into goals. Um, Wouldn't Devlin's a starter? He's played in the both cup games. He's a he's an ever present in the league. Uh, he's a it's an absolute certainty. I think Guthrie will, will come back in. For, obviously, he was rested for one of the cup games, but he'll come back in. And, you know, I think he'll start with Ambrose alongside him as much as I've been a, a fair critic of uh, Effie, uh, it would be fair to say. I think Effie will, will play the game alongside Guthrie. And I, it looks like Serrano's got that left-back spot um, secured. Almost he's back uh, fully fit, played in the, the cup game, and, and he looks solid. The, the defensive sort of midfield situation, that's where there's question marks. For me, I think Bartley and Sybil are going to start there early in the season when we were getting some good performances. I think Sybil was arguably our best player at the start of the season and he dropped out the team. Results fell away slightly. I can see Sybil slotting back in there. Pittman will undoubtedly come back in. There's no doubt about that. Pittman is an ever-present in the league as well. I think everything that's good about us over the years and is good about us this season goes through Pitts. 
And then I, I, I really like the Forrest Mullen combination. I think it offers us so much going forward. Good balls into the box. Forrest coming from the, the sort of d- dropping inside and getting his shots away. Mullen going outside, getting those good crosses into the box. And I think Jay will, will, will relish those good balls into the box. He got his first two goals in the cup. Hopefully he can get his first goal or maybe two in the league. And hopefully that sort of sets us off in the league for sure. To be honest, I agree with Andy, with the goalkeeper and the defence. I, um, I think that Ambrose coming back in adds in what we've talked about probably a few times this season is that bit of experience. Um, and I think that's what we'll probably need. I would, I think he's going to go Bartley, and I don't think he'll play Sibbled as a centre mid. I think he's going to go with Holt or Robinson to, to go in as his centre mid role there. He's going to play Pittman ahead. And then this is where I think that the last couple of games about what we've seen, we've seen Sybil play as a winger on the right-hand side, which allows him to pl- to come inside. And the only reason that I think he does that is if we play Mullen and Devlin on the same wing, both players like to hog the touch. Like you're taking away Nicky's, what nicky has been good at all season, driving forward, creating chances. And I think if the, the two of them play, the two of them want to do the basically want to do the same thing. They're both wanting to get the ball out wide and they're both wanting to try and get the crosses in. I think Forrest will play another side um, and I think he'll go with Jet. but for me personally, I, I would go with Tiffany. I think Tiffany's been offered us the most whenever he's played up front so far this season. He's proved a lot of people wrong so far and his performances have just been, have, have went up a notch compared to last season. Um, but I think that's the way I can see it going with Sybil playing out in the right and Forrest on the left. Just just to pick up on something you said there, Cal, Nicky Devlin, from some quarters of the fan base, has been criticised slightly for his defensive showings this season. Do you not think given playing Mullen gives Devlin more an opportunity to defend rather than go forward? Obviously, you're losing out with Devlin and his bombing runs down the sides, but you're gaining that from Josh Mullen. Does that allow De- Nicky to then concentrate on his defensive duties that he's been criticised for this season? I'll be honest, Andy, I've said this probably for the majority of the season. We knew what we were getting with Devlin. And last season, when Devlin played at the start of the season, he was attacking fullback. And one of your two centre mids that sat there at the start of last season would, would slot in. We would move out there and they'd slot into that position. And they would cover when Nicky went forward because we were actually looking dangerous going forward. We are scoring goals and we are creating chances. I think that we went away from that. Too bothered about trying to play. We've not got that person that's going to go and slot in. And I think that we need to get... That's what I'm saying, getting back to the basics. We need to think about our defensive shape and everything like that. But say you're asking Nicky to defend, we're taking away one of his biggest strengths in his game. We've got a fullback there that loves to attack and creates opportunities. How many times have we seen Devlin hit the byline or get into the box and create opportunities? One of the one of the midfielders just needs to be tactically aware and drop into that space when Nicky goes. Or if your two fullbacks are going, slot in and make it a back three, and just keep yourself solid. And that that's the way I would say. I don't think I think that the criticism can be a little bit un, unfair because Nicky's been asked to go forward. If he wasn't being asked to go forward, you wouldn't see him making those runs. No, I think I think you're right. We we knew what we were getting with Nicky. He's a he's a fullback that loves to bomb on. You could arguably say he's been one of our most creative players this season and the number of chances he creates by overlapping on that side. I mean, when you play kind of 4-3-1, you're reliant on your two sitting midfield players to almost cover for your fullbacks going on a bit. And you know, that that's all part of your kind of defensive shape. Um Serrano likes to get forward as well, you know, just as much as Devlin does down the other side. So it's reliant on your kind of two sitting players covering across and and closing that gap. I mean, I can't argue too much over the team. Um, the only thing I would do, I would have Robinson in. I always think we're a better team with Robbo in it. I'd have him on the right hand side. I think he's really clever with his link up, and I think the opportunity to get Devlin bombing down the sides is a big threat for us. So I, I would incorporate Devlin in there. Um, I agree with you, Wall. I've said it before, my thoughts on, on Tiffany. I think he offers us something totally different up front, but I think with his kind of recent layoff in isolation, I, I can't see him starting the game. I think it will be Jet that will start the game. Um, but I think 
we have a rough idea of what our strongest team is. I think there's maybe three positions. I think that are really always up for debate, which is kind of one of the sitting players out on the right hand side and then up top. I think are probably the positions that are of most doubt in the team, um, which are always the ones we tend to have the most debate about. Uh, so, have it, having a look at obviously how we want to set up, what we think in prediction wise for the game. Yeah, listen, I don't think there's going to be many goals in the game. I think St Mirren, despite their poor form and, and their struggles this season, defensively, they've still been pretty good. I think they're the fourth best defensive record in the league, which is some going considering they've only got what, eight points in the in the league. So you have such a good defensive record, shows there's not a lot of goals in their games. Um, I think we will score, though, and, and I think it'll be tight. And I'm, I'm going to go 1-0. Lovely. I'm going to go a nervy 1-0 victory for us. Yeah, I agree with you, Andy. I don't think there's going to be a lot of goals in it. I think the first goal is going to be absolutely pivotal in the game. A bit like the first game of the season. Once they went 1-0 up, we really struggled to break them down. They, I think it's been evident since Jim Goodwin's gone in. They are quite resolute defensively, but they've lacked a lot going forward. I think if we get the first goal, I think we'll catch them again. So I'm going 2-0, Livy. Unfortunately, I do not see us keeping a clean sheet. Um, I think it is going to be 2-1 Livingston. I think that we've got a lot of frailties at the back this season. We don't look ourselves. Hopefully, I'm wrong. Hopefully, we can keep a clean sheet. And But I'm hoping that it's going to be 2-1 Livingston and I can get back up that league table. Well, that's it for this episode of Talk Livy. It's been a busy few weeks for the podcast, so thanks again for everyone who's tuned in and continues to listen to the podcast. You can also find all our episodes, including this one, on all good podcasting streaming sites, including iTunes and Spotify. We're also on YouTube. Search for Talk Livy and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. If none of those options suit you, all you have to do is head to our website, talklivypodcast.libson.com, where you will find every single episode we have done over the last couple of years. So that's it for episode 18. We'll be back with a new episode on Sunday, but for now, playing us out this week is Graham Hunter with a belter of a song that perfectly sums up how the nation is feeling right now. He is a Thank you.